the tie hack industry was an industry that supported the railroads and there were railroads all over the country and wherever there was a railroad there was a source of ties. In the early 1800s, the United States, still in its infancy, relied on the development of the railway system as a key player in its industrial revolution, and later in its expansion west. Railways became the lifeblood of the nation. They determined what industries would succeed, where population centers would emerge, and drove the country's economy. Wyoming emerged as a microcosm of this model. With the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, Wyoming was now an important industrial hub. With a way to transport them, agricultural and mineral resources in Wyoming became viable industries and people came. A rail system is very interesting. It sits on a, a bed of crushed rock. The ties are laid in that crushed rock and then the rails are set upon the ties and rails were spiked to the ties. And so that entire system floated on the crushed rock bed. Starting in roughly 1915, the area around Dubois began to be harvested for ties. The men who cut these ties were known as tie hacks. Many of the men who came were from Scandinavia. The company that started the tie hack industry eventually became known as the Wyoming Tie and Timber Company. And their headquarters were in Riverton, Wyoming. But the work was all up here in the mountains west of Dubois in both the Absaroka and Wind River Range. These railroad ties went to the uh, Chicago and Burlington and Quincy Railroad and eventually the Chicago and Northwestern Railroads because those were the railroads that were up here in this country. A railroad tie had to be, for the most part, eight feet long and eight inches square. And the early requirements for that tie was that it be flat on two sides. The reason for that was flat so that it stayed on the ground and uh, the other opposite side was so that the rails could be put on it. When a tree was felled, they would pick an appropriate size tree and then they would go to work with a double bit axe. So he would drop the tree, he would go along the tree with his axe and trim off all of the branches. That means in the length to see how many ties he was going to get out of that tree. He would stay with that double bit axe and the two horizontal sides he would score with the double bit axe. Then he would come along with the broad axe, and that's an axe that has a broad head, and it's flat on one side. And then he would go along with that broad axe and trim all of that slash that he'd just done with the double bit axe. He would then measure out the eight foot lengths, and with a cross cut saw, he would cut that log into the eight foot lengths. Then he'd roll the log over and trim the branches off of the bottom of the, so of the log. And at that point, the log was ready to become a tie. He would mark that one end of that tie so that he knew that it was his tie. A uh, tie hack might cut as many as 25 or 30 ties in a day. And then he would get paid, depending on what the price was at the time, it could range anywhere from 15 cents to 25 cents a tie.
So from 1915 till the late 20s, most of the ties were cut by hand. Then the uh, diesel-type portable sawmills became part of the cutting and shaping process. The logs then would be dragged out of the forest along the river banks and then that's where the logs were decked. And decking was stacking the logs with the uh, butts of the logs facing the river and those stacks could be 15 or 20 feet high side by side all the way along the river bank where they would gather those, those ties. For a few years during World War II, an unexpected group added to the ranks of the tie hacks. About 1944 till 1946, there was a German prisoner of war camp up on uh, Little Warm Springs Creek. And uh, that camp was staffed with about 140 prisoners of war. By most accounts, these soldiers took to the life of the timber industry, laboring in the mountains and in many ways endeared themselves to the other tie hacks and to Dubois in general. Many came back after the war, and some even stayed and lived in and around Dubois. The ties didn't go in the river until the river crested, which was about the middle of June. That means that the high water had ceased, and so there's kind of a low spot in the middle of the river. That's when the ties were all pushed into the water. Everybody participated on the river drive. When you look at the lay of the land of the Wind River up here, it's full of rocks, it's twisty, it's fast, and it was a real chore, and log jams were not an uncommon thing on the river drives. OSHA would have had a nightmare during those days. The tie jams had to be freed up by finding the key logs and undoing them with a long pole with a point on the end of it, we called it a pike pole, and these guys would literally get out on the log jams and start trying to get those logs undone. These guys had to be incredibly strong and have a great understanding and be about 95% daredevil to keep those logs flowing down the river. It would take them probably into and around the 4th of July to finally clean up all of the logs off the riverbank and get them all down to Riverton to where they were sorted and then processed. Dubois celebrates its tie drive legacy in many ways. They hold Swedish style smorgasbords to commemorate the big meal that the tie hacks had after the tie drive was over. They also use the very same Dutch ovens that fed the tie camps for various celebrations. Riverton has remnants of the tie drive influence as well. The treatment and sorting plant is no longer there, but a rails to trails project allows pedestrians to visit the site. Also in the Riverton Cemetery is a plot dedicated to the tie hacks who were so important to the area. 32 tie hacks have been laid to rest in this plot with a hand-hewn tie memorial to their contributions. It was uh, almost a 24-7, 365 job because it was, it was that critical to the, to the railroads, especially during the war years. It wasn't an easy day, but it was a day that all of them liked, or they wouldn't have been here. They came for the thrill of the mountains, for the openness of the mountains, the freedom that the mountains offer, and a place to earn a living and raise a family. <laughs>